is worthy. Amen? He is so worthy. Revelation 5. Revelation 5 this morning. This is the this is the passage that, that song comes from, the course of that song. This is not going to be a comprehensive teaching of Revelation 5 uh, at all. So, 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 let me say one more so. Much could be said and taught and needs to be about this passage, but we just want to focus on one tiny little specific part of it, but that is incredibly huge in and of itself. If you want a better teaching of Revelation 5, join Paul Tatton's Sunday School class. <laughs> They're going through Revelation right now. Um, but here in Revelation 5, John, the Apostle John, is given a vision of heaven. He's given a vision of what is to take place in the future. Uh, he's given a vision of the culmination of God's plans for the earth in time events. In chapter 4 right before where we'll be today. What John sees is the glorious worship of the Lord God Almighty upon his throne, and it is glorious. It's so interesting that in his first, the, the first part of his vision here, he's taken to heaven, and the, worship, the, the vision is of, of worship centering around the throne. So often we think heaven is about us and just it's the greatest of what we experienced here just in an infinitely awesome level but uh, but heaven is about God and heaven is and will be about the worship of God it's going to be about him it is about him it's chapter four center of heaven's worship is God in chapter five here what John sees is he sees a scroll and there's a scroll, a book, your version may say, in the hand of the Lord upon his throne. This scroll, to save you a lot of uh, working through it, and we could, but just, uh, just to kind of sum it up, this scroll is, is like the title deed to the earth. It's a record of, of how God will claim what is rightfully his. In this scroll is a description of how God will carry out the end-time events that right all wrongs, that punish the wicked, that defeats sin and Satan, that redeems the saved to set up his kingdom on his earth, his earth. Initially in this vision, nobody is found worthy enough to take this sealed scroll, to open its seals and set in motion the end time events to bring about God's future kingdom on earth. And this causes John to weep. But then he is told to stop weeping, for there is one who is worthy, Jesus Christ himself. And so demonstrating his authority as one, as the one who is worthy, Jesus, seen in the vision as a lamb, he steps forward. He takes the scroll from the one on the throne. And when he does, a song in heaven bursts forth. Verses 9 and 10. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God and they shall reign on the earth. You see, the one who would be appointed to inherit the earth, the one prophesied to be appointed to inherit the earth, to be given dominion over all the earth at the end of days, to rule and reign and defeat all his enemies, was first to be slain and bring redemption to his people from all over the world. This is Jesus. So, of course, he's the one worthy to take the scroll. Appointed as God's Messiah to rule and reign over all the earth, Jesus was slain to ransom people for God from all over the earth. And in his death and in his resurrection, Jesus defeated sin. He defeated Satan. He defeated death. He defeated that which cursed the earth and brought it into bondage. Jesus is over all. He's God himself. So he has inherent worth to carry out God's plans and to redeem what is his. He and he alone 
is the only one worthy to take the scroll. Execute God's judgments to break the seals. You look at chapter 6 of Revelation. To defeat Satan, to redeem his church, to claim the earth as his and set up his earthly kingdom where he will rule and reign in peace and righteousness with his people. So that's the context of this song. But what I briefly want to do this morning is just focus on the price of that redemption and the people whom Christ has redeemed. See, the price of redemption. The worship song sings that the price for the redemption of God's people is the blood of Jesus. Jesus is seen in God's vision as a lamb who was slain. And the idea of of, of ransom or redemption or being redeemed, here's what it gives the idea of. It gives the idea of, of paying a price for someone who is in captivity, someone who is in slavery, in order to set them free. So you get the picture. You know the picture. Everyone who has ever been born, except for Christ himself, everyone who has ever been born is held captive to sin held captive to its awful, terrible, eternal consequences. We all have sinned against the infinitely holy God, Romans 3, 23. We have all broken his holy law, and we deserve an eternal judgment and an eternal hell. Romans 6, 23. This is a price we will pay if our sin is not forgiven and we aren't declared righteous. But folks, Jesus... The ultimate liberator paid the price for our redemption from sin by his own blood. About Jesus, John the Baptist said in John 1 29, he says, behold the, here's this lamb image, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 1 Corinthians 5 7, Paul says, for Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. So we get this image of the lamb here. We get this image of Jesus being a lamb. So John the Baptist calls him a lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Paul calls him a Passover lamb. And in the vision of heaven, the one who is worthy to take the scroll from God on the throne is seen as a lamb. What can help us understand this is is the... the, uh, the history of of how the Hebrews, who are the Israelites, became, uh, got set free from Egypt. You know this well. So the the Hebrew people are held captive in Egypt as slaves. God sends Moses to say, let Pharaoh let my people go, and he does it, and he sends all these plagues, and then Pharaoh isn't convinced, and here comes this last plague. It's the death of the firstborn, that every everyone all over Egypt, that death was going to come to their firstborn. But God told his people, the Hebrew people, hey, if you take a spotless lamb and you sacrifice this lamb and you take the blood of that lamb and put it over your doorpost, when death comes to Egypt, death will pass over your house and your firstborn will not die. But those in Egypt who did not do that, death came. And so what ended up happening is when death came to Egypt, the loud, a loud cry as, if, as had never been heard in the land before, the Bible says, happened. And Pharaoh said, get out of here, Hebrews. And he sent them away. And so, and then he obviously chased them again to the Red Sea and that whole story. But what God did through the blood of the Lamb is to set his people free from captivity in Egypt and to save them from death. And this is the picture of the gospel for us. This is the picture of what Christ has done for us, that all of us are enslaved to sin and enslaved to death and enslaved to eternal hell unless we are liberated, freed from it. And what Christ did is he came and he, he, he bore God's wrath for our sin on Calvary's cross and he rose victoriously on the third day and the price for for our our sin was paid for so that through faith you know those those israelites they had they had to have faith in what god said and put that blood over the doorpost and they did 
When we put our faith in Jesus and his shed blood for our sin, the Bible says that we are forgiven and we are justified. We are made right with God. We are declared righteous. We are no longer held captive to our sin. It's forgiven. We are no longer held captive to sin's consequences, which is death. We are given eternal life because we are seen as righteous in the righteousness of Christ. See, Jesus is the lamb, Isaiah 53, the lamb that is led to the slaughter, who was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. Jesus is the lamb slain to ransom his people. But notice, I want you to look here in in chapter 5. After John weeps, verse 5, And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. You see, John was told that a lion had conquered, the lion of the tribe of Judah, and then he is worthy to take the scroll and open its seals. Catch this church. Jesus is a conquering lion who defeats Satan, who defeats sin, who defeats death, and who redeems God's creation and his people. Yes, he is a conquering lion, but when John looks... Does he see a lion? No. He sees a lamb appearing as it it had been slain. Debbie, I wonder if you heard me when I read this quote this week because it made me excited. This is Matthew Henry. Listen to what he says. Before he, Jesus, before he is called a lion, here he appears as a lamb slain. He is a lion to conquer Satan and a lamb to satisfy the justice of God. How glorious. That the one who would conquer Satan would do do so by saying, God, Father, sacrifice me for their sin. And he willingly became that lamb. What a Savior who obtained his church, Acts 20, 28, with his own blood. The price of our redemption, the redemption of God's people. But look, look at the people whom Christ redeemed. Verses 9 and 10 again. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Jesus himself in Mark 10, 45 says, that he came to give his life as a ransom for many. You see, Jesus gave his life to ransom many people from sin. People from every tribe. People from every language. People from every people and nation. From every group all over the world who share a common lineage. That's tribe. From every group all over the world with the same language, from every race of people, from every people bound by the same government, that's nation, from all of these groups, and if you think about it, these groups overlap a lot, right? But from every group bound by these common things, God will, will, will redeem people held captive by sin. He will, from all these groups, free people from sin's dominion, from its power, from its consequences, so that they can live for him and serve him forever. From people all over the world, God will bring salvation. He will bring them into his forever kingdom where he rules and where he reigns. And he will make them priests who will have total access to himself through Jesus Christ. People from all over the world, every tribe and language and people and nation who will worship him and serve him forever and who will reign with him in his future kingdom. And church, these blessed privileges are not just for the redeemed of those who look like you and who look like me. The kingdom of God 
oh bless his name, is a community of people from every tribe and language and people and nation who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Jesus. Everyone all over the world have the same sin problem and the same answer to their sin problem. Jesus and the redemption he offers. I'm going to say this and I want you to hear it. God cares as much about the salvation of a young woman in Southeast Asia that he has called to himself as he does your kid and your grandkid and your neighbor that he has called to himself. So like him, we should desire that he receive praise and salvation. Or he, he receive praise and they receive salvation from people all over the world. So how can we actively work to that end? We can go. We can go. Matthew 28, 19 to 20. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. We can go, and we should go. Some of us need to get on buses and planes and boats and however it needs. We need to get there to go internationally to proclaim the gospel of Jesus. But, ladies and gentlemen, I'll tell you this, too. There are people from every, every tribe, not every, but, but lots of tribes and, and, and languages and, and people and nations here in our city. So we can go down the road and reach the nations. We should go internationally. We should go nationally. We should go locally to reach people from different tribes and languages and nations and people to proclaim the gospel. So we go. That's how we can actively work to the end of God receiving praise from people. We can also pray for more workers in the fields. You remember when Matthew, uh, in, in Matthew when Jesus is looking out and he sees all the people who um, are harassed and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. You remember he has compassion on them. And, and um, he, he, he tells his folks, he says, look, pray. The, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Pray that more workers go to the harvest fields. All over the world are people who are lost without the great shepherd to guide them into truth and to eternal life. Folks, the harvest is plentiful, so we need to pray for God to send workers, more workers into his harvest fields to rescue sinners from sin and judgment. We also pray for missionaries. Colossians 4, 3 through 4, Ephesians 6, 19. Paul, you remember we talked about Paul a few weeks ago in prayer. You know, he's, he's, he's asking for prayer that a door would be open for the gospel to go forth. So we pray for missionaries that a door would be open for them to declare the gospel and to declare it clearly, Paul says. And in Ephesians, he wants to proclaim it boldly. So we pray for the missionaries that are living and working all over this world that a door would be opened and that they would proclaim the gospel clearly and boldly. And then we can give. Um, look here. It's Christmas time. You're going to find out really quick where your treasure truly is. By how you spend your money. How you spend your resources, your money, your time, your energy, your thought, uh, what takes up space in, in, in the thoughts of your head. How you spend all the, 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 the stuff of your life shows what you and I value. So if you value worldwide mission and global mission and people in our city coming to know Christ, you'll give to that, to that end. Financially, but also Physically and time-wise and energy-wise. God's global mission and His glory going to the ends of the earth. Church, it has to captivate us. It has to prior prioritize the mission, the efforts, the resources, and the prayers of our individual lives and the life of our church. I know, great goodness, I got four little rats that live in my house. I love those rats. I'm, but I know our lives are full. I know they're full. But have we filled our lives up without God's heart for the lost in mind? Beloved believers, our lives are not our own anymore. They are the Lord's. We are in his service now to take the praise of his glorious grace 
to our next door neighbors, to our families, and to people all over the world. So listen, just a quick little mental exercise. I want you to think of what God has done for you and for people all over the world in the work of Christ Jesus upon Calvary's cross. Think about that. When you were singing, is he worthy? And you were seeing who is, that Jesus has won salvation and we're thinking about what Christ has done for you. Isn't that glorious? Isn't that worthy of shouts and worship and proclamation? When we think about what Christ has done for us and for all all over the world, him, no life goal, no bucket list item, could form a greater desire or a greater priority than telling everyone of God's worth and bragging on him. Not just for giving you food on the table. I know you do that. Thank you, God, for this food. Look what God did to get me through this health scare. My God's so good. Look what he did. He gave me my family. My God's so good. Look what he did to to give me this and to provide for this and to make sure I'm provided for. and And we should brag on God for all those things. But our loudest praise should be that God sent Jesus as the lamb to be slain, to ransom us from sin, to save our souls. Listen, it happened this morning in my Sunday school class. It happens to you when something awesome happens or somebody in your life does something good, you want to brag on them, you tell people about that. Look here, God has done something good for you. And he has sent Jesus to save you from your sin. Our lives need to brag on him constantly. That's what we're here for. So here's my question as we close, as as I close. Has the wonder of his salvation overwhelmed you to the point that you want to tell everybody about him? Is he so worthy to you that you want him glorified by people from all over the world? Do you look at and just say, you know what? When it all boils down to it, I'm just here to tell people about Jesus because he's so good. It's our job to work and to pray to make sure people near and far know how beautiful and wonderful, righteous and holy, forgiving and merciful, justifying and redeeming, providing and protecting and saving and sustaining is our God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So yes, Missions is for the lost to be saved because we care for them and we love them and we don't want them to go to hell. But ultimately, missions is so that our holy and redeeming God can receive the praise of which which he is so worthy. So church, Ken, has that truly captivated you and is that moving you to share him with others? Let's pray. God, help us to be captivated by what you have done and to be captured by your heart for the nations and our heart and our lives change to reflect your heart. God, may we as a church, even more than we do now, may we as individuals, even more than we do now, Adjust our lives, fill our lives with proclaiming the gospel to the lost in mind.